Ron Berger is Chief Academic Officer for Expeditionary Learning. EL is a network of over 160 public schools in 30 states, a nonprofit organization that partners with districts and charter boards to create public high schools in low income communities that send all graduates to college. It helps to transform existing public schools, K through 12, toward high student achievement, character, and citizenship. EL also works nationally to build teacher capacity through publications, professional development, and by producing Common Core curriculum. I'm, re I'm gonna stop there because I know you all have uh, Ron Berger's book. I know you've read the book. And I want to get to probably one of the best that I've seen and someone that I would want to be educating my children, my own children and my children here in Mecklenburg and in Cumberland and all over. He's an outstanding educator, Ron Berger. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope to leave you with two things today. I hope to leave you with some affirmation that the work you do is the most important work right now in America. As teachers and school leaders, I don't think that we as educators are given the respect and importance that we have in shaping the future. I hope you leave with some more heart of this is why I do what I do. And I also hope you leave with some practical strategies and ideas. Because even though in my work now, I work with schools all over the country, I spent 27 years teaching. In my heart, I am still a classroom teacher. And I hate to go to events for professional development where I don't walk away with something particularly useful. So I do hope that there are some ideas or strategies today that feel concrete and useful to you from what I share. I'm also going to ask you to push back with questions, with doubts at any point. Um, from the question and answer period of this talk to the rest of the time I'm here at lunch or after lunch, very happy to answer questions about any of this work. Uh, I remain living in Massachusetts. I'm a Red Sox fan, so this was a really good year for me. <laughs> I did not grow a big shaggy beard, however. My wife was glad. I live in the same town where I taught for 25 years, the town I wrote about in my book. Basically, everyone who lives in my town who's under the age of 45 is a former student of mine. So it's a small world where I live. It's still a town with no stores and dirt roads, and I live on a dirt road. But you know, my plumber is my former student, and my nurse is my former student, and the guy who plows my driveway is my former student, and the volunteer firemen who helped my wife when she was injured are my former students. So this obsession I have with quality is something that's actually quite selfish. Because if the students that I taught have that ethic of excellence, that sense of quality, my whole life is better. And I think even though we're a much broader country than the tiny little town where I live, I think of that in a broad way. That if our kids, your kids, have that obsession with doing things well, with creating things of quality and being quality human beings, all of our lives and our communities will be better. I think as a country, we're obsessed with the wrong thing. Right now, we're obsessed with assessments. We're obsessed with getting kids ready for tests. When a student graduates from school, she's judged for the rest of her life by the quality of person that she is and the quality of work that she does not by her ability to do well in a two-hour assessment. And yet all we do in schools these days is be concerned about getting kids ready for assessments, even though it's a skill that won't matter in the rest of their life. Imagine if our obsession with schools was creating quality kids who do quality work, because that's what really does matter in life. And so for all of you as school leaders and teachers who in your hearts feel like that's why I teach, I hope today will be a lots of affirmation for that part of you. Today I'd like to give lots of practical strategies for how an obsession with quality can make kids flower in all ways. And interestingly, flower also on tests. 
because in my work now, I work with 160 schools across the country, mostly in low-income urban and rural settings. Most of those are district schools, they're not charters. Many of them are the lowest performing schools in their cities. And if those kids didn't do really well on tests, I wouldn't have a job. Because that's the only way my work is measured now, by the test scores of the kids where I work. And yet, that's not what we focus on. We focus on quality work and quality character. And the test scores just happen to come along because kids have a different sense of themselves and a different sense of their mission to work hard to succeed. In fact, when I visit cities, and I do all the time to look at how schools are doing, there's a pretty direct correlation. The worse the school is doing in the city, the poorer the kids, the more test scores are the only thing they focus on. The schools that do better and better on tests as you go out to the city of the suburbs are the schools that focus less on that one obsession and more on the quality of kids' thinking and the quality of kids' work. So my hope to you is that intuitively you know that's true and that you can make that more a part of your vision in your school and your classroom. My talk today is called Building a Culture of Quality in Schools because I really do feel like it's a cultural thing. When new kids move into a school we work with, they begin to change because they see things are different. And it's building a whole school culture where quality is what we obsess about, not production. I said in my book that in my entire youth, all I did was work on a treadmill of turning in work, turning in work, turning in work. Every day I turned in work. It was not great work. I got A's because I was a good student in that world. But nothing I did was something I still have today because it wasn't high quality. And how could it have been when I was cranking out work that quickly? When it was handed back to me, I threw it away. I brought it home sometimes and gave it to my parents, but rarely. As a counterpoint, the students we work with in our schools, and we work with 50,000 students, work every day on drafting higher quality thinking in their math, in their reading, in their writing, so that they come out with something in the end that they're proud of that they still care about years later. So I'm going to start today by going through a few of the, the general ideas and then mix slides with video. Because what I really don't want to do is talk. I really want to show you images of quality work and thinking. So. When I say quality, I mean quality in many dimensions. The first is the kind of people we are, having respectful, kind kids who treat each other well. Our integrity and our citizenship, as well as the quality of what we craft in schools. It's who we are and the kind of work that we do. And the way that I think kids become people obsessed with quality is allowing them to contribute. All of us want to contribute. Every kid wants to contribute something. So where do they have the opportunity in our schools and classrooms to actually contribute? For some kids, the only place they feel like they contribute is in sports or in arts or in music. And those are great places to contribute. But can we also make sure that those kids have an audience for their work in academics as well as in sports and in music and art. So in mo many communities, the only time the whole community shows up at school is to go to a chorus concert or a soccer game. Now, I played soccer and coached soccer. I was in plays in high school. I am, I am a great fan of sports and arts. But that should not be the only time that kids have an audience for their work. Everything kids do should be leading for an audience beyond the classroom so that you as teachers are the coach, not the audience for their work. And we need to give kids the opportunity to do what I call good work. I'm using the word good work, borrowing it from Howard Gardner. I was fortunate enough to do my graduate work at Harvard Graduate School of Education with Howard Gardner, who is the man who did the multiple intelligence work. And after his multiple intelligence work, he moved into something called good work. And he defines good work as being excellent, ethical, and engaging. 
But since we work with preschool kids as well as high school kids, and they don't know what ethical and engaging actually means, we've, with Howard's permission, changed that to good work means it's good in quality, it's good for your soul, and it's good for the world. And so we are saying to kids, you are getting smart to do good. Not to make a lot of money, not to get famous, but to do good. And it seems crazy, but I do feel like there's a virtuous side of every kid who wants to contribute something. And that kid wants to be able to do something that he or she is proud of. Whether that's just an illustration they did that's beautiful, or a, a poem they wrote that's beautiful, or a major project that transforms their community. It's that idea that they're contributing something of value beyond their classroom. And so our mission is, can we get opportunities for kids to do good work, to contribute beyond their classroom for a public audience? I'm going to stop my chatter now and move to video. I'll give you one example of what I would call good work. These are middle school students. One of my favorite schools in the country that I get to work with. The school is in Portland, Maine. It's a school that is the, has the lowest socioeconomic demographic in the state of Maine, but has higher test scores than almost any school. So on every single subject in every single grade, this school exceeds the state averages in Maine for their state test, even though they are the poorest school in the state. They also are a school that's a refugee placement school, which means that a third of their kids were placed in the school without English as their first language, sometimes without any English, sometimes without any school background, because many of them are Somali and Sudanese. They have 30 languages spoken in this school. So how can they be a high-performing school when they've got the poorest kids and they're dealing with 30 languages? I could try to explain it, but I think it's much clearer if you watch five minutes of those kids themselves on video. But you're from Arkansas, yeah, yeah. and, and oh, I grew up in Black Mesa. Hi. Good morning. Hello, and thank you so much for coming. In Windsor 7, we've been working on an expedition called Small Acts of Courage. This expedition focused on the civil rights movement in the United States and the local community members whose small acts needed to be captured for all to read. Today we just finished our culminating event for our expedition, Small Acts of Courage. This is an expedition that focused on the civil rights movement and we um, studied the civil rights movement and major events in the movement and then students interviewed local citizens who participated in some way or had some connection to the civil rights movement. Our presentation today is dedicated to our interviewees. We thank you for your time and we thank you for your stories. Today as part of our culminating event, we presented our work to parents, but most importantly, to the interviewees so that they could see the work that the students completed in their oral history collection and they could hear the words of the students as they paid tribute to their interviewees. Ida Marie Gammon Wilson's Small Acts of Courage contributed greatly to the civil rights movement. In college, she joined students practicing for the natural sit-ins. They practiced how they would handle segregation at the lunch counter. They also practiced ways to stay nonviolent. Ida was a part of the Nashville sit-ins and also helped other students get a diploma by taking their places in their classes and helping them study if they missed opportunities to get information. Throughout the sit-ins, Ida courageously worked behind the scenes to keep students in school and on the front lines of the integration effort. Ida remains active in civil rights today as well as gay and women's rights. She is a great inspiration. I think this expedition works because, first of all, the content is extremely compelling for students. Their experience with the interviewees creates an emotional connection to the content that they cannot get in the classroom and really motivates them to work hard to write their stories and to present their work to their interviewees. Julia Adams is a selfless woman who accomplished a lot in her lifetime. During her senior year, she befriended Josephine Boyd, the only African-American student in the newly integrated school. She went over to Josephine Boyd and asked her to sit with her and her friends at lunch. 
This was an act of kindness that would change both of their lives forever. Taking a courageous stand has had an impact on Julia's life. One day, a woman with a baseball bat was looking for her at school because she felt Julia shouldn't be helping Josephine. Years later, Greensboro, Greensboro High School honored Josephine for being the first black student to integrate the school, and at the ceremony, Julia Adams gave a speech. Even today, Julia Adams can be found helping others. We want to set every student up for success. So we had a rubric involved. I taught kids how to stand correctly. We talked about eye, uh, eye contact, volume, speaking slowly and clearly, and we practiced those skills in my classroom. There also was rehearsing, where we took the students through the process of what would happen at the culminating event, and it all felt very familiar to them today. Windsor 7 is honored to present our four-volume volume collection of oral histories related to the Civil Rights Movement to the African American Collection of Maine. Thank you for supporting us throughout this project. Sometimes it's not possible to get every student in front of an audience. So it's important to build in some structure where students can celebrate their work and share their work with a significant adult. And we often find a reception after the event really works well for this. You know, it is really wonderful to find that something small that you did um, has an impact on the next generation. It, was, it felt good to do it. Her story was important because she helped Josephine Boyd become the first African American to integrate Greensboro High School and her story needs to be heard. Culminating events are a time when every student's work is celebrated, where every student has the opportunity to be a part of their individual success and the group's success. It was an honor, I guess, to be able to present her story to her and um, show her how much she actually affected people. And to have their work appreciated and to share that with the community and to realize their work is a part of something much bigger. Textbooks are often behind the times. They do not reflect how we are and where we've come from and where we've come to. And this kind of presentation by these young people, I think, would be just an absolute wonderful experience for everybody to have because we are making some strides in this nation. So I think that's much more powerful than me trying to describe King Middle School for you, except to say it's just a regular middle school in the middle of a depressed part of a city. It has no extra money, it's not a charter, it doesn't have any special privileges, it just has a different vision of the capacity of kids. And they're putting kids on a mission to do good. And because of that, those kids are stepping up. I'd like to bring you through a number of examples of what I would call good work so that hopeful from all different grade levels so that hopefully some of those as models might resonate with you. Here we go. Ninth grade students in Springfield, Massachusetts. This is a district school that uh, we helped to open but it's a regular district school in the middle of the city. This is uh, Springfield, Massachusetts is a uh, a city I wish was in the triangle, frankly. I, it's a city that had very robust manufacturing 100 years ago and now has half its population and lots of boarded up places like Detroit. Um, and the public schools do very poorly. We came to the district in Springfield and said, we're willing to open a high school with you. It'll be a regular district high school, but you have to let us do it differently. If you allow us to do the teaching and learning differently, we'll guarantee you will get 100% of kids into college. Now they thought we were nuts because at the time, and still, the other high schools are only graduating 50% of their kids. And only 20% of those kids are going to college. So how are we gonna get them all into college when it's the same kids? But at that time, the superintendent was uh, visionary enough to say, we'll give it a shot with you. And he allowed us to open this district school it's a lottery school to get into, and we did. That school has now had four graduating classes. It's been eight years. Every class, every student has gotten into college. Last year, their classes are small. I will tell you right now, we don't open comprehensive high schools with 3,000 kids because we can't do it and get them all into college. 
Last year, uh, every class is 100 kids, 100 ninth graders, 100 10th graders. Last year, 90 kids graduated because some kids had moved away. Kids are not dropping out. Of the 90 kids that graduated, 84 of them went into college. Six of them got into college but went into the service. Every kid was a success. We believe that every kid should get into college. We have some schools where kids get into college and don't choose to go to college right away because they want to enter the service or they want to enter a job right away. But they will know for the rest of their life that they are college material. If they're 25 and they decide, I think I want to go to college, I think I got into college when I was 18, I can do it again. I know that college is not necessarily the right answer for every kid and their family at this time, but I do think that once kids have gotten into college, they have a different self-image for the rest of their lives. And that's been our mission. This is one of many schools that we have with 100% college acceptance. Why is that the case? It's projects like this that has transformed that school. This is called Green Print. This is a report for the city of Springfield that's a blueprint for a greener city. These students in the school, most of whom are low-income kids of color, were trained by city engineers to do energy audits of city buildings. And they then went around to the city buildings they know best, which are the schools, and figured out how energy efficient are the schools. So these kids went in and checked the insulation, the windows, the HVAC systems, the boilers, and they figured out where the city was losing money in its schools. They created a report for the city and they publicly presented it, saying, here's the elementary school, here's the middle school, here's how much money you're losing every year on poor energy treatments, and here's how much money you would save if you invest in all of these treatments. They suggested to the mayor that he invest $156,000 into energy retrofits for city buildings. Because they did this publicly, part of our ethic about work being public, the mayor actually had to respond. So the mayor went back to his city engineers and said, what do you think? And they said, we trained them. They're right. Their data are good. And so the mayor, and he's still the mayor, Dominic Sarno, bless him, was open about this idea. And he said, we're going to invest $156,000 of our money to follow the recommendations of these ninth graders. He did. And in one year, they saved $80,000, $84,000 in energy expenses. Within two years, they had saved $160,000 in energy expenses. They had more than made back every penny they invested, and now they were saving money and helping the environment at the same time. The third year, he came back to the school and said, we just set aside a quarter of a million dollars for energy retrofits if your students in this school can be energy auditors for our city. These are kids who could have seen themselves as we're the kids in the ghetto that never graduate and never go to college. Instead, we're the kids on television and on the front page of the newspaper telling the city how to invest its money. Now, the kids did point out that it was kind of like slave labor because they were doing pretty high level work and not getting paid yet. But they also pointed out that very soon when they all graduated from college and they were assuming they would all gradu graduate from college because this is a 100% college school, they could make a lot of money doing what they were doing now as ninth graders for free and helping the world at the same time. A perfect example of good work. At a lo lower grade, one of my favorite projects, the A to Z Book of Homelessness, created by third and fourth graders in DC. These kids took on a project of studying homelessness. The reason they took on a project of studying homelessness is that their school was surrounded by homeless people. In order to get into their school, you had to walk around homeless people. I used to do that all the time. These kids decided we need to make a difference. So they split into small research teams, five or six kids and one adult, and they went out with three guiding questions. They went to different agencies, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, police stations, social workers, with these three questions. What are you doing to help the homeless? Why do people become homeless? And what can we as kids do to help the homeless? 
Then each research team came back to the third and fourth grade and reported what they found, and the class came up with an action plan. Some of their action plan was charity. Some of it was raising money, getting clothing, getting food. But the most important part of their action plan was they learned something that they didn't know when they started, which was that homeless people lost more than their home. They kind of lost their humanity because people stopped treating them as people after that. They didn't want to make eye contact with them. They didn't want to talk to them. They felt like they were a pariah. And so these kids said, we need to educate the world that homeless people have humanity, that they're still human. And they decided they would start by educating little kids. Now, if you teach high school, you think third and fourth graders are already little kids. But you know if you teach third and fourth grade that they don't think of themselves as little kids. The little kids are the first graders and the kindergartners. So they created an ABC book about the humanity of homeless people. Every page in this book is written by a different kid, and it's something about how homeless people are human too and have feelings that we need to remember. L is for lonely. I'm lonely because people don't notice me. And then the illustration of loneliness by that third grade girl. H is for heart. Homeless people have heart. They help other homeless people. They made multiple copies of this book to be spread around DC to schools, to be read aloud to pre-K and K kids, to be read by K and kindergarten kids, to be given to homeless shelters. And after their project was done, I asked one of the boys in the class, I said, Jamal, what do you think you changed from this project? And he said, Mr. Berger, everything changed. And being a blockhead adult, I thought, what do you mean everything changed? There's still homeless people right outside your building. Because, you know, you didn't solve homelessness in DC. But I didn't say that. I said, Jamal, tell me more. What do you mean everything changed? And he said, Mr. Berger, before we did this project, we didn't even know the homeless people. We were afraid of them. And now we know who they are. And every morning, I walk to school and I say, good morning, Fred. Good morning, Doris. And they say, good morning, Jamal. Have a good day at school. He said, everything's changed. And I realized in his small world, everything had changed. It had gone from a hostile environment to a community in his little neighborhood. And I think that's a lot to have done as a third grader. He is a social activist already at age nine, starting to do some good. Now let me tell you how important that book was to them. When they were eighth graders, they had a distinguished guest at their school. And they went up to their teacher and said, could we go down and meet our distinguished guest and give him a copy of our book? And the teacher said, what book? And they said, the book we made in third grade. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was in eighth grade, the last thing I was thinking about was something I did in third grade. Most eighth graders can't even remember something they did in third grade. This mattered enough to them that they wanted to give it to their guest, even though they had made it five years ago. And they did. They went down and gave the book to their guest, and he has a copy of it right now. This was their distinguished guest. <laughs> this was the first school in America that the president and first lady visited after his inauguration in 2008. It's a mile from the White House. He visited this school, not because of this project, but because it was one of the highest performing schools in DC, even though they focused on projects and service. And this is one of the few things in life that I share with the president. I have a copy of this book. He has a copy of this book. <laughs> we don't need to choose in our work between success on academic measures like tests and college and doing good work with kids. The, those two things work together. The schools within our network who do the best work are the schools that also score the best on tests and get the most kids into college. Working on one is the same as working on the other. When you look at the test scores of students in our schools nationally and in the regions, they are double digits above the rest of the region, sometimes 25 points above. And these are schools that don't focus on test prep. And 100% college acceptance is our standard in our high schools. So it's not a choice here. You can have both. I'm going to take a break for a moment from my urban journey to, because some of you have read my book, 
I thought it would be only gracious to sort of show you my life. So this is my town. It really has only seven buildings other than homes in the woods and trailers. It's got the church. It's got the post office, which is also Mary Dillman's home. And I taught Mary Dillman's kids and I taught Mary Dillman's grandkids. And you gotta go into her house to get the mail. <laughs> it's got the town hall, which was the two room schoolhouse until I arrived in the early 70s. And the one business in the entire town is the Shoot Spray Athletic Club. If you live in Raleigh or in Richmond, you'd think this is a place with elliptical trainers, but it's a country bar. <laughs> when you first come to town, you think, why is it called the Athletic Club? But there's a lot of athletic drinking and dancing and watching of sports <laughs> that goes on there. So. This is the only town business, and it's surrounded by pickup trucks half the year and snowmobiles the other half of the year. <laughs> and then there's the school. That's the whole town. In this school, every older kid is assigned a younger kid. They take care of that younger kid. They help teach them to read. They help to teach them math. They help them to put on their snowsuits. They help them to tie their shoes. They protect them. They ride the bus with them. And Unlike me, when I was a kid, when I was in first grade, I was scared of sixth graders. In this school, every first grader has a sixth grader taking care of her all the time. Here's another wacky thing. Kids work in the school where I worked for 25 years, and not just on schoolwork. They cooked, they cleaned, they raked leaves, they shoveled snow. And I know that sounds nuts, despite the fact that it happens all over the country of Japan, half of the maintenance of schools is done by kids. In this country, people would say, I don't send my kids to school to scrape plates. Except luckily in my community, since people learned that that's just the way it was at this school, they would say the opposite. They would come to school and say, I have a really hard time getting her to scrape plates at home. I'm so glad she does it here and likes it. And you can imagine that if kids are shoveling snow and cooking and cleaning, it's just a much cleaner school if kids are helping out with the culture that they live in. I opened my book with the story of my fifth and sixth grade students building a playhouse for kindergartners, which they co-designed with kindergartners. Every day after school, kids built, and on weekends. This, it's hard to tell from this, but it's actually a two-story playhouse with a tiny staircase inside. Uh, that's Colin coming out of that playhouse right now. Now, it's a blessing living in a little town with no government. I live in a town with no mayor. The government is everybody in town shows up in the only space in town, which is the school cafeteria, the auditorium space, and fights with each other in a town meeting to make any decision. And it's, it's small town democracy at its best and at its worst. We argue about $50 all day. I mean, it's hard. But the beauty of having a town with basically no government is that we could make the kids take over all the jobs that adults do in regular towns. So, when the state of Massachusetts, for example, said they needed an amphibian census for each town, which amphibians can you find that live in your town? Other towns hired a naturalist to do that. We had no money, so we used 38 third and fourth graders. And those kids spent their time in school and after school going into swamps, going into woods, and collecting amphibians. They became experts in identifying both adult and even larval amphibia. They became total experts, like young herpetologists. And they collected a lot of amphibians after school and on weekends. They took photographs, they took measurements, and when the project was done and they sent their data to the state, guess which town in Massachusetts sent in the most amphibian data? It wasn't even a fair fight. Every other town had one guy or one woman showing up for a couple days to do a sampling. We had 38 kids doing nothing but hunt amphibians every day after school, every weekend. They got a, 
letter back from the state saying, dear third and fourth grade herpetologists, thank you so much for your great work. Your town sent more data than any city in, or town in the state of Massachusetts. Went on and on. But at the end of the letter, it said you did make a few errors in your species identification. Two of the species you listed don't actually live in your town. So what's the one thing that kids remembered from that letter? They were so mad. <laughs> and then they had to learn how to write a polite letter back. <laughs> and they wrote back and they said, thank you so much for your thanks for our letter and our data, but we respectfully disagree with your critique of our data. We believe we made the correct analysis. Here are more photographs, here are our measurements, and we invite you to come meet with us. <laughs> well, the state contacted the kids and said, we're sending out a state herpetologist. The state herpetologist came out. He could not find our town. It's hard to find anywhere. No one's heard of it. When he finally found it, the kids brought him through the woods to the bog, and you know the kids were right. And so they showed him that, yes, they had correctly identified these two species. And one of the kids said, Mr. Berger, we're not just practicing to be scientists. We kind of are scientists. And they were. So they realized that if there were going to be a field guide to the amphibians of our town, they had to make it because no, they were the only ones who actually knew what lived in our town. So they created the first amphibian field guide to our town. This is a cover by a third grade boy amphibians of our town. This field guide ended up being very important to me because I brought it to that school in Maine, King Middle School, that I showed in that video about the Small Acts of Courage project. And they decided, okay, we'll create a field guide to the little bay right next to our town. Now, it turns out that that little bay, Casco Bay, is actually visited by thousands of tourists all the time because Portland, Maine is a tourist site. And so this, unlike the little field guide in our town, which nobody's ever heard of, people would actually buy this field guide. And so this field guide, created by students like this who come from Sudan and Somalia, along with very poor white kids growing up in Portland, has a page by every kid in the seventh grade. And it's sold at bookstores, and tourist shops and the National Park Service, and all the money raised goes to help restore Casco Bay. So imagine being a seventh grader and being able to take your parents or your friends into a store and saying, this is my book. This is our class book. I wrote this page. This is my research. I was never that proud of anything I did in all of my education through graduate school. These seventh graders were that proud. And because the origin of my organization was a combination of Harvard Graduate School of Education and Outward Bound, which is a wilderness organization, we're sort of into pushing kids out of their comfort zone. And together, getting everybody up the mountain. And so in this school, which has a very Outward Bound tradition to it, they didn't allow any kids to draw a jellyfish by going online and looking at a photograph of a jellyfish and copying it. Those kids had to go down to the bay and put on wetsuits, which we borrowed, and go underwater with underwater cameras and take pictures of these. So why have kids go in the freezing cold main ocean to take pictures of jellyfish when they could download it online and copy it? Because this experience makes you think being a scientist is the coolest thing on earth. And you cannot wait to go home and tell your parents that your teachers are so crazy that they put you in a freezing cold ocean to take pictures of jellyfish. It's a life-changing experience. And if you wonder why in that school, kids from Sudan sit next to kids that were born in Portland and laugh at lunch, it's because they, the day before they were freezing and screaming together in the water and getting through it together because there was some adventure in their work, because they weren't sitting at a desk doing test prep all the time every day. They were really tackling life. I brought that King Middle School field guide to the lowest performing middle school in the state of Massachusetts. And they took it as an inspiration to create a field guide to the bog behind their school, which they did. This school went from being the lowest performing school in the state on ELA 
to equal to district averages within three years. And not because this field guide raised their test scores. It's because this field guide was the first thing they had done that they were proud of. It was the first thing which changed their definition from being, were the kids in the worst school in the state, to were the kids that created this beautiful product that everyone's showing around town. Now we should study for our work because we have a different self-image. I took that field guide to a pre-K and kindergarten and they decided we need to create a field guide to the park down the street from our school. And these pre-K and kindergarten students created a field guide along with an arborist that's accurate even if their spelling isn't yet perfect. I took it to a third and fourth grade in Rochester, New York, and kids created a field guide to a local park. In my collection now, I have 60, maybe 70 field guides from around the world and around the country of kids who have decided, let's contribute something by creating a field guide that doesn't exist to something local. And I took that field guide to High Tech High when High Tech High in San Diego, California was just getting formed. And the founders of High Tech High sat with me and this field guide from middle school and they said, well, geez, if middle school kids could do a field guide like that, and we're creating a project-based high school, what could we do here? And a few years later, they created their first of six field guides, forward by Jane Goodall, sells for $25, thousands of copies in each print run. It is the definitive field guide to San Diego Bay written entirely, photographed entirely, laid out entirely, researched entirely by high school kids. So this simple idea that started with my third and fourth graders creating a field guide has now spread around the country and around the world as just an idea of let kids do real work. Let them do something important that they can share. And High Tech High has taken it to this whole new level where they now have six $25 field guides that you can order online from them that raise money for the school. And of course, it doesn't just have to be science. You not only can research amphibians in your neighborhood, you can go out and study the depression by interviewing everyone in your community who's lived through the depression and create oral histories of their lives. Or you can go out and study World War II by honoring the veterans in your community who served in World War II, like these kids in our high school in Dubuque did, and told the stories of World War II veterans and honored them as local heroes. Nobody had told these people's story ever. This was un unmined, beautiful, real life stories. And if you want to take a kid and have them learn World War II history, one way is to say, next week you're going to have a test on World War II. For the kids who are used to getting A's and want to please their parents, they'll study. For the kids who are used to doing poorly, they could care less. On the other hand, if you say, in two weeks, you are going to be walking into a room with a veteran whom you need to honor, and you're going to be interviewing him about his life in World War II, and if you don't know the war really well, you're not going to understand anything he's talking about. Those kids think, oh my god, I better take this seriously. We're creating a book, and I better learn my history. You can see that those kids study their history with a whole different mission when it's to do some good for the world than when it's just to please their teacher. All of the student work samples that I've showed you are now hosted online. I spent five years with my staff scanning them and hosting them online in an open source environment. I have some handouts on tables that give you that web address. But I encourage you, we now have about 300 student projects uploaded online that you can read the context of, you can see the standards they hit, and you can download the project and print it if you want to use it with your own students as a model. They start with three-year-old work that goes all the way to 12th grade work. And it's all open source because teachers have given it to us as a nonprofit to share with the world. This is just sort of spreading. I do want to say that when you look at beautiful student work, you often think, yeah, but my students, you know, I mean, you must have picked the super fanciest work to show. But it's not about choosing the super fanciest work. 
The best way to tell that story are my, one of my favorite sequences of slides, and I actually mentioned this in my book. This is a strange product. It's a cave home design done by a kid. It's a place for people to live underground. It's done by a sixth grader named Jamie. This is Jamie. That's her real name. She lived right next to the elementary school where I taught for 25 years. Very poor family. No dad in the family at present. Mom who ran a daycare center out of their sort of trailer home. But Jamie had her own horse, which she bought with her own money. Because Jamie was the most sought after babysitter in our town. Because she was so together in every possible way. She was creative, she was responsible, she was tender, she was sharp and, and energetic. But in addition to being the world's greatest babysitter, she was also severely learning disabled. And so in school, Jamie struggled with reading, with writing, with math. She was in tears a lot. Because we were a project-based school, she still found success. She was in the mainstream classroom getting support. And here's Jamie as a first grader on the left when she published her first book. So she found pride in her work. But she came to me as a fifth grader and said, Mr. Berger, I know the kind of projects you do because you had my brother. And I can't do projects like that because my brain doesn't work right. And I teased her. And she just started to cry. And she said, you don't know how bad my brain is. Well, the second day of school, we went cave exploring, part of my Outward Bound connection. And she was brave, helped other kids, was terrific. But on the third day of school, she had to design a cave home. And this was her first draft. She didn't understand cross-section. She didn't understand above and below ground. She didn't get conceptually. She was spatially confused. She started to cry. And she said, I refuse to pin it up for critique. She said, I'm ashamed of it. And I said, Jamie, you have to get critique, but you don't have to pin it up. So she went to her friend, Nicole. Nicole re-explained cross-section to her better than I. And on her second draft, she actually gets this concept of cross-section. She said, Mr. Berger, you can pin this one up for critique. It's much better. So we did. And one piece of critique she got from the cutest boy in the class was that those overlapping rocks looked really good on the top. And so her third draft was all overlapping rocks. <laughs> then she got some critique that her second draft actually had better space. And she said, that's not, impossible. that's not possible. This is my latest draft. It's my best. And they said, yeah, but you lost some of the space in this draft when you went to the all overlapping rocks. And so she said, all right, I'll combine the all overlapping rocks with the space for my second draft. And she created a fourth draft that had both of those qualities. And then she said, Mr. Berger, this is getting really good, but my handwriting is still sloppy, and I know you teach calligraphy. Could you teach it to me really fast? And I said, well, no, Jamie, but if you were to trace calligraphy in the classroom, you could get better at it. And I had a light table in my classroom where kids could trace. When I was a kid, tracing was called cheating. And then when I started doing architecture, I realized it's just a tool that you use in life. And so my students traced all the time in order to get their skills. So Jamie came in early every morning, 7 o'clock. She'd walk through the bushes behind the school, knock on the door. I'd let her in, and she would trace. For, after a week of tracing, this was her freehand calligraphy. And if you're a calligrapher, you can see that it's not consistent. But if you're not a calligrapher, you think, that's not bad. And when you look at her final draft, this is a close-up. Even the lettering is carefully done. So when I'm showing you high-quality work, it's not work from the kids that are usually called gifted. It's work from kids who had the gift of doing multiple drafts and getting critique and sweating over it and being able to make it great. Many of you have seen the Austin's butterfly video. That's a perfect example of it started out as a little butterfly and ended up as something beautiful. It's not about handpicking the great students. Now, I've often gotten critique that this only, my images are all visual. What about the important things like math and writing? So let me show you a five minute clip of working with young students around how do you make your writing better? What makes good writing? So I'm going to jump back to video for a moment. We're going to read one story today, just one. And it's written by a first grade boy named Nate. And we're going to try to figure out. 
we're going to try to figure out why this story is a good story. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think it's a good story. I really enjoy it. Today we were working with third graders around the quality elements of a fantasy story, using critique as a lesson. Once upon a time, there was a dancing ballerina prince who was named Ernie. Prince Ernie was in love with beautiful prin Princess Max. Just giving kids descriptors of what we hope they will do, whether those descriptors are through learning targets or whether they're through a rubric, it can often feel to kids like it's just words. I like this girl, and I don't know if she like. do you know what I mean? Much more powerful is to bring in a model of great work, and then have the kids themselves be detectives, to have the excitement of discovering quality themselves, and then naming that quality in their own words. The battle was tough, but he was tough. I think it's particularly important that we're using the work of real students. Hit them and smack them right in the bumper. Bumping yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a nice way of saying but They're amused by it, they see problems with it, it's not perfect, and yet it has qualities that make it sparkle and shine, and it's available and accessible. They know another kid did it. And they lived happily ever after. Can you all give Rosa some applause here? So your job now is to be detectives at your table and think, hmm, what did Nate do that makes this story interesting? I think he used a little bit of imagination in his um, story. Imagination. And he made up like characters. He made up Prince Ernie. Ernie. Prince Ernie. He probably used other stories to get the idea of that the story. And he decided to copy a princess book, but not like copy it, but like not think of princess stuff in that. And he add more details. Okay, time's up. Papers down. Who can name something for me that makes the story work? And Jamal, I'm going to start with you because you immediately said, I like this part of the story. Um, bumper. So two things I'm hearing there. One thing is you like it because it's funny. I am in a positive way manipulative in these settings by when I hear a kid have the kernel of a great idea that I see. Anybody's story can be helped by some humor, but I also hear you saying, Jamal, that his word choice was good. Something that's a kernel of an important convention in a discipline. I will rephrase it for them and then try to put it in language that, that makes it barely available for all kids. Great. What else? He added more details. Good. Can you give me an example there? I think that's right. Page seven. Good. Read aloud. Right. The part that you thought had some good details. Was not over the key. And when there's important features in the work that kids have not yet come out with, I might pose it as a question. Now, did, did he spell everything right? Um, no. And then they sort of discover it on their own, but in truth, I've planted that for them. If you have a great word and you're not sure on how to spell it, was he brave enough to use it? Yes. Yes. So he was brave enough, be brave, to try hard words. One of the things I really loved in today's critique session was their explication of his character as having tension between being brave and fighting battles, but also being scared. I was afraid you wouldn't like me. Me too, she said. That's what I would. And why did it surprise you? He was afraid. Good. Oh, Hayden, this is so great. Because do you think that this guy's a pretty brave guy? Yes. 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 Me too. Like, he, what did he stand up to? What are the obstacles he stood up to? He the was villain, the trolls. And the witch. The witch. I always come into a critique with a strong piece of work, and I know the qualities of that work that I hope kids and then will find. When did he find. get scared? When he was trying to talk to her. Exactly. He was shy. Exactly right. I love that, Tatum. What else? Maureen, what do you see? Um, he had imagination. Good. Princesses. So the critique is really doing two things at once. It's teaching them the attributes of a high-quality piece of work in that genre. Trolls and stuff, uh, imagination. But at the same time, it's teaching them the critical analysis of how to critique work, which they then use for their own self-analysis. It, it, it makes them better self-assessors, and it makes them better peer assessors. Great. Having something a little scary is OK to have in your story. 
There's not one right time to use a critique. It, it's hitting the moment when kids need that information, when everybody could be lifted. You know what? I'd like to make a longer story. I'd like to use some more imagination. I'd like to put some more obstacles in it. And it's, like it's using a, a tangible, concrete piece of work to do it, not just language to do it. It gives them a vision. familiar with? I can't spell them perfectly, but I'm going to try them. I'm going to try to have some surprises in my story. So I hope the message there is that it's not always about the grand projects of changing the whole city of Springfield, even in just a piece of student writing. It's crafting it until it's high quality. Even just one story that a kid does can be a contribution that he or she is proud of. I do want to give you the update on Jamie because one of the best things or worst things about living in a small town is I know basically what's happened to every kid I've taught. Um, the kids I taught who spent some time in jail I knew about. None of them are in jail now, I'm very happy to say. Um, the kids who've gone through hard times I've known about. So Jamie is one of those success stories. She graduated from sixth grade with me and went on to middle school, still with a very major ed plan, but went to high school, still with a major ed plan, and graduated from high school. And for some people, graduating from high school doesn't sound like a big thing. In her family, it was a very big thing. Um, other than her brother, I don't know anyone in her family that had graduated from high school. She, after high school, went to college at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture, majoring in horse management, equine studies. Now, unfortunately, her mother didn't live through her college years, but I went to Jamie's college graduation party, never been more proud of a student in my life. Jamie came up to me at her graduation party with two big plastic cups of beer, handed one to me. <laughs> and she said, Mr. Berger, it's the darndest thing. I have a college degree and I have the same darn learning disabilities as I had in first grade. I said, you do? She said, I still reverse letters sometimes. I still reverse numbers. I said, so how did you do so well in college? You got A's in college. She said, strategies. Same as my whole life. And I thought, here is a great message. Huh? It's really not about do you have a learning disability or don't, are you brilliant or you're not. It's about how hard do you, are, are you willing to work to create great quality things and can you use your strategies. Jamie today is doing great. She's got a 15-year-old daughter who's a star horsewoman who wins all kinds of awards. Jamie manages a horse farm. And if she could find a good husband, her life would be just perfect, I think, right now. So it's great to run into her when I get to see her and, and still be proud. I'm going to finish this morning's presentation and then take some questions with one of my favorite recent projects, which is this project, What Snake Am I? This is a children's book written by second graders in Boston about snakes. And it's a book that has beautiful writing and illustrations written by little kids in Boston in their study of snakes. Now these kids started their project by looking at Austin's butterfly. And they decided we're going to do multiple drafts of all of our writing and all of our illustrations. So when one of the little girls decided to do a spitting cobra, this is what her first draft looked like. But having seen Austin's butterfly, she knew, that's just my first draft. I'm going to get critique and get better. And so this was her second draft, and her third draft, and her fourth draft, and her fifth draft, and her sixth draft, seventh, and her final draft. This class took this idea of multiple drafts in their writing and in their work very seriously and produced a beautiful children's book that you can buy, and it's as high quality as children's books you'd buy at a bookstore. Interestingly, in the course of their studies, they also learned that snakes are persecuted. They had studied the fact that people can be bullied and persecuted, and they realized snakes are bullied and persecuted. Number one, people hate them and say bad things about them all the time. When you read stories or fables, snakes are always the bad guys. And people kill snakes even when they can't even identify them. 
So they decided snakes needed an advocate and they needed to stand up for snakes. So they discussed how could they create something to make people respect snakes that would reach lots of people. And they decided that the best way would be to create a music video about snakes that would go viral. And then everyone would learn. And there were some people like I who tried to explain to them that just creating a music video doesn't mean it will go viral. It doesn't just happen that way. But luckily they didn't listen to me and they created a really high quality music video where they got critique and they did choreography and they got access to a studio and guess what? It went viral <laughs> and it's been seen by almost 40,000 people. And my wife is not an educator. My wife's a nurse in my small town, a visiting nurse. She goes to people's homes and there's not a whole lot I do in education that I can get her interested in. She gets tired of my same old stories. But this piece of work is, she thinks it's the best thing I ever did, even though I didn't do it. All I did was support these kids to create this video. She's been showing this video to everybody. She'd go into patients' homes and say, do you want to see the video that my husband was working on with kids? Uh, it really is catchy. So I'm going to end with this video. The kids took the Lady Gaga tune, Born This Way, which is a tune about people that are born gay or transgender or different or just different looking and the fact that you should accept them for who they are because they were just born that way and they created the lyrics to a song called Snakes Are Born This Way and somehow it got adopted by Lady Gaga fans and by herpetologists all over the world so it just keeps spreading so I'm going to end with this video and then take some questions. It doesn't matter if you're scared of them or not. Just open up your heart because snakes were just born this way. Okay, we've got time for some questions, and these questions can be as hard a push as you want. I mean, you could say, that was great, but it was cr totally crazy, and I can't see doing any of that wacko stuff. Or it can be, tell me how this works in this setting, or any kind of question is fine. We do have another mic. Um, so if anyone, teacher or school leader, has anything they'd like to push or ask about? Okay, in the realistic world, when we know that we don't want to focus on standardized testing, but then there's a part of us that, part of it that we have to, how do you find the balance? And what portion of your day is attributed to project base and then the standardized test hovering over you as well? Great question. I know that I am not suggesting that standardized tests don't matter. 
because it's the primary way in which you are judged, your school is judged, your students are judged, and it's the primary way in which I am judged. When I go in to meet with superintendents, when I go in to meet in, D in DC with state people or district people or national folks, despite the fact that I travel with a suitcase of beautiful student work, what they really want to ask about first is the test course. That is the currency of all conversations right now. So I'm not suggesting that it's not. It's always a balance. Here are the things I would say. Your projects should be hitting on the same skills as you need to prepare your kids for those exams. You're not picking project ideas out of the blue that you have to sort of squeeze in around the edge of your teaching around that. If you know that your kids are working on concepts in reading and writing that they need to get better at, you build your projects so that they are immersed in those same skills in the projects. So that they are critiquing and building work that gets them ready for those very same things. So your projects are rich in literacy. They're rich in data analysis. They are rich in the things that you need to get kids ready for. Now, of course, when a test is looming, there's going to be some things that you need to get, make sure kids are ready. They need to have test taking skills and they need to understand the format of the test. I think there's no problem with taking that test seriously. I just spent two weeks prepping my grandson for SATs, going over his house at night and doing it. it. You're crazy not to when they have high stakes. On the other hand, if that's what you do all day long, all year long, kids just check out. It's, unless they have some motivation from their family to be always the good student, why would they care so deeply? And so I think invest much of your time doing great, exciting work with kids, and so when you need them to step up and prepare for an assessment, they're right there with you. They have a good self-image, they're excited about the work, and they see the incoming tests as just another challenge that they can all work together for. So yes, it's always a balance. I think that's a great question. And I never think that tests are not the currency. They are my currency and yours still. Thank you. I'm wondering about the connection with the community as far as the studio and the parks and the people involved. How do you go, do you go about getting the, the people to help out or do the students go about doing so? What's the connection there? How are they involved with that? Great, and so uh, how do we get communities involved with this? I, I think every community is full of people that would love to help with what's going on in schools if they knew how they could help. And so the idea of starting to build around each of your schools a network of people that can support your work as experts and as collaborators, uh, once you get it going, it starts to, to feed. If you don't have time and personnel in your school, get a really dedicated parent who's willing to become your community liaison to go out and talk to people in your community and figure out what they're willing to do. Are they willing to host kids? The big difference, I think, is using community in a different way. People are used to being asked to give money or just to pitch in their labor rather than to collaborate with you and be experts in some way. And parents and community members are really glad usually to pitch in when they understand it's part of something that's helping the world in some small way or contributing in some small way. A big change is what we in EL would say the change from field work, I mean from field trips to field work. So when I was a kid we took field trips, which basically means you go and you see something and it's like a day off school. Field work means you're actually going out to do some research. And once your community gets involved in your field work, they know they're contributing to something different. The best way to, for me to distinguish field work from field trip is this. I was working with a first grade classroom and they took those first graders in part of their state mandated study of colonial America to a restored colonial village. This is in Massachusetts, so there's a village called Sturbridge Village, it's like colonial Williamsburg. The kids went there and they saw the weaver and the baker and the cooper and the blacksmith. 
If they had come back and finished it, that would have been a field trip. But they didn't. They came back after their day of being amazed by how different it was in colonial times. And then they each chose one colonial profession to be an expert in. And one week later, the class went back to Sturbridge Village and each student spent an entire day shadowing a cooper or a blacksmith or a baker and taking photographs and recording what they said. And for those that could write well, taking notes. And each of those students had a parent as a support researcher with them who could take notes for them. Now it's really different when you're a parent coming along on a trip just to chaperone versus you are this first grader's research partner. You're helping write down what she's learning in the blacksmith studio or the baker's bakery. And after a day of researching, those kids came back and put together a presentation to teach all their classmates about what a colonial baker did or what a colonial cooper did. And when I visited that first grade classroom, every one of those first graders knew more about a colonial profession than I did. So that was the difference between a field trip and field work. The field work is research. And if the, your community can get involved in your research with you, they can pitch in. And so I think getting those folks in your community to understand that you're part of these new projects that they can contribute to in an important way. And once the word gets out, you can get them to bring their friends next time and to connect with their other companies and businesses and friends that they can support you. But it's part of the virtuous cycle of this, that the community starts to get excited about the work you do. Um, maybe we'll do one more question. And yeah. Right up front. I had one on um, the structure. So if this is, if you're focusing on projects as a classroom teacher, and you mentioned that you had a school design that is kind of promoting this project base, what is the structure of the day? Does it change from what we're used to? Is it block? Is it uh, collaborative? I mean, you must have had to make some kind of administrative changes for that. Thank you. So the question is sort of, what about the scheduling of these kinds of projects? Uh, the first thing I would say is these projects really vary from being a couple weeks to many months. And I'm much more concerned about quality than scope. If you did a project this year with your students that only took two weeks, but the result was beautiful work, even if it was little, I not only would celebrate it, I would hope you'd send it to me. My email is right on this handout. If you produce something with your students that you are deeply proud of, please consider sending it to me because that's how I have hundreds and hundreds of pieces of student work to share. So it's not the scale, it's the quality that really matters. Although maybe you want to do a three or four month project. But you're right in saying that it creates some differences in the structure of your day. So first of all, these projects are all interdisciplinary. So if you're at an elementary level, you have to say, I can't always think that it's 40 minutes of reading, followed by 40 minutes of unrelated writing, followed by 40 minutes of math, followed by 40. You have to start thinking, you know, this project actually crosses some of those boundaries and I can work on those together. If you're a secondary teacher, you have to think, you know, I'm doing this science project, but we have to write it up and I actually want to create a report that we're giving to the community and I could really use help from the English teacher on this. So I am going to reach out to the English teacher on my team and say, would you be willing to dedicate some time to doing multiple drafting of their report on this or to reading journal articles so that they can understand scientific language. So getting some collaboration on a secondary level. There's not a formula for this, but I would say that the same basic skills as you're working on in your class can be woven into the projects, but when it gets closer to the end of the project, whether that's two weeks in or three months in, you have to be flexible about time in a way that you weren't before. Because there's no way you can create a beautiful project in tiny chunks. You have to be able to have a math teacher say to the science teacher, or a science teacher say to the math teacher, 
can they miss one class so they can have a double session with me because we have to get in deep on this one. Or we need an entire day for rehearsing for our community presentation. And you have to decide just like a, when the school play is happening and some kids are being released for rehearsals, if it's an important project, teachers have to let go of every day is going to be exactly the same. So for example, when I told you about that field work study where kids spend an entire day, that means that the reading teacher might miss a few students for her Tuesday thing because they're spending a whole day doing research out at a, at a colonial village. Or it might mean the gym teacher doesn't even get to see those students that day. You need to have a faculty culture where when there's an important project going on, people are willing to be flexible and in return, people will be flexible with them. So it, it has to be not so rigid at certain points in the project. And so it requires flexibility at the school leadership level and it requires flexibility on a teacher level of saying, I'm willing to let my kids go on this field work experience or I'm willing to get them more time with you and in turn, when I need more time, you'll be flexible with me as well. So I hope that we're not driven so much by time that we sacrifice quality always for that. Um, I was aiming for uh, 75 minutes, so I'm right there with time. But I will be here till three. I'm very happy to answer other questions in person uh, in any way I can help. I, I hope that the main message of this is to empower you to feel like what you already believe about the capacity of kids to do high quality work, you feel a little bit more empowered to say, I'm gonna try to carve out more time for kids to do work that they're proud of and that I'm proud of in my work. Because the work that you do is the most important work in America. I'm not just saying that, I spent most of my life doing that. Um, this is the future of America, the kids that you're teaching. So thank you for your service to this most important profession. Um, and I hope that you will be sending me personally some really cool work in the next few years uh, that you're really proud of that I can share around the country. Thank you.